from the agenda point of view. We come to the analysis of Linux as part of a system, which basically is an overview about the systems work group and how important the view on the system level is. As said by Kate in the beginning, the use of Linux in aerospace may be a little bit limited, so therefore after the systems work, we will enter into the QA discussions. And yeah. But this also means I have one or two more minutes oh, yeah. if I need. But I don't have too many slides. I saw we may be late. The last mini summits, we have always been late, so I shortened this one. But uh, yeah. But first, I need to find my mouse again. Another time. Here we go. So here we go. Right. The next part is about the systems work group, and the systems work group is not that old. There have been other work groups before with the medical devices, automotive, and so on. And the initial idea was to have it more as an industrial IoT work group, uh, as a new vertical in there. But we figure, figured out that there's also repetitive architectures in various systems. And then we need something to put the different working groups into uh, a context of a system. So we want to enable other working groups. We want to have a reproducible reference system. The reference system is not seen as a safe reference system. It's basically an exemplary system and based on real-world architectures. What this means we'll see a little bit later. And therefore, we also encourage a lot of communication with other communities which are belonging or yeah, to the system context of it. With that, sometimes you can also start a little bit smaller. So from this use case, we would like to go more on the evolutionary paths. And for now, we always have safety in mind when we're doing these things, but they are not safety focused as much as the other work groups, where there's really a use case on it. We said we could maybe also just start with this beautiful vacuum cleaner in there. And say so there is not really a safety uh, part in there, unless the vacuum cleaner hits you maybe. Or the cat, yes. <laughs> this could be something in there. But then an evolutionary level could be also to just go in towards agriculture mining, which is not the ISO 26262 from an automotive perspective, but they have relaxed safety requirements because they are in an isolated environment. But yeah, please excuse if I say it like such. But in the end, the vacuum cleaner, which moves autonomously in the room, it's similar like an lawnmower or whatever, or some agriculture goes autonomous on a larger field because there is not expected to be humans in there. It's not a full speed. It's not a highway. Less interactions, more autonomy, autonomy in there. And then this gives a lot of learning for the system. And this is really the idea of the systems work group that you can get an understanding of a system, get seen how it's used, and that you can extrapolate and add more and more responsibility to the different use cases. So this, I basically have put in this figure where you can see that's how things could go. Similar like from the previous session with automotive where you may start with a telltale with an instrument cluster which doesn't look like anything to do with others, but maybe it's close to park distance control. Maybe it's closer than also to a camera-based system. And by this, it brings us forward. Yeah. We saw the system part already a little bit, how the things get in. This was also in the initial slides from Kate. So if you draw a system architecture these days, you will find a hypervisor in there typically for automotive, for other industries as well, because you have different virtual machines. If it's not directly hypervisor, it could also be that you just go one level up and have a containerized environment, which you may enable for security reasons, may, first of all, not for the safety consideration of it, but there will be container architectures. Heads up information, there's no container consideration as of such, or as such as of now in our system. So we are not integrated containers because we're not yet there. But where we started with was to see what's left and right. So there's often not only the microprocessor, but also microcontroller. And 
if you take the working groups, they mainly concentrate on native Linux, so that's why architecture results, Linux feature results will directly go into the Linux machine, domain, whatever you call it, from the hypervisor part, but you can start seeing the interactions with other system elements. The code improvement also goes in there, while the uh, tools, of course, also go into the wider scope of building such a, such a system, so it could be I've seen that the Yocto tooling, where we have been in discussions with Yocto project, and there also the open source engineering process. Of course, the SDPA and other parts of the open source engineering process go along all these different areas, so they are everywhere, so I just put them on the outer frame. And then, last but not least, you see that the use cases will tailor the system, so they bring it down to what you really need, and this could be also that the Linux should be getting another option. So while we start with an AGL, which is Yocto-based, if you want to reconstruct a system, you may have a Debian-based one. So the CIP project or the Apertus, which both are Debian distros, could be an alternative to get in to see what does this mean if you create a system suddenly out of it? What does it mean if you create an S-bomb with Debian rather than the Yocto tooling? Yeah, and then Xen and Zephyr as the additional projects around it. These were also the first projects which we reached out to, more or less, directly in the beginning of the system work. They were also the Xen projects starting with the demo last year. Additionally, we got a strong support by AGL, so they are also joining regularly on our meetings that we are discussing the use cases. They also have a setup with alternative virtualization, not with the Xen hypervisor, but they were also the provider of potential hardware, uh, or at least supported hardware. Uh, we have discussions with Sophie and Eclipse SDV. They are not really in depth, and we want to enhance this because here, I guess, there are discussions about mixed criticality workloads, and we add these. Then there, maybe we can contribute their last as extensions. There's also the Yocto project and Wolf more generally for building the system. Yocto also provide layers for Xen, provide layers for their fire. So there is the idea of also bringing things together that we all build the whole system with Yocto which would be nice to show. You can create a large system just using one build tool. On the contrary, you can also say, if I use VAST and other tools involved there and maybe have a meta tooling around, this makes it more interchangeable and you can say, I can tailor something and I'm compatible with more than one tool. Uh, Linaro, of course, also due to the ARM ecosystem, due to the close connection to Sophie, is an interesting partner here. We have been there two weeks back on Linaro Connect to discuss about it. And the main idea always is to say, well, if you have an Apple and I have an Apple, if we exchange these Apple, both of us still have one Apple. But if we have an idea, if I have an idea, you have an idea. If we exchange the ideas, we have both two ideas. And that's where these things come up, and especially also with Xen, Zephyr, we share this problem space of safety certification in open source. So here, the strong relationship plays into picture, and therefore I'm also referencing uh, Stefano's talk from last year. He formed the base for our aesthetic partitioning. If you see what he has done, he built a reference system with Linux RT, Zephyr, the Linux Domu, and the Xen underneath. His intention was basically very similar. He said, I developed all these features. I'm going on conferences for years now, always giving new features of Xen and Xen. And then the people come and say, but how do I reproduce it? How can I experience it? And that what was what he presented last year. He showed this is how things get together. But from his perspective, he was not concentrating much on where do I get my Zephyr image from? Where do I get my Linux image from? He just took a root file system, tied things together, and said, they will be there. People will know I show something about the Xen features. And that's where we hooked on and said, we want to do something more. And we had it in the automotive session. We have it here again. There was this QMO part. And as Stefano was going out, he also based this on a QMO because he could directly show it live in the conference, have something to share easily. But in the end, people would like to see it to run on real hardware. So therefore, we said, let's try to bring things up on real hardware and involve different parties. So we checked with Automotive Grade Linux, what hardware do you support? What's in there? We checked with the Xen project, where is a good Xen support? 
check with Yocto project where can we build with Zephyr as well. And by this we get things a little together. The SPDX is not really for the hardware selection, it's basically more for the tools around it, but just for the completeness there I mentioned. And then the funny thing started because we come up with a lot of challenges. The first thing is we need to find a hardware and all the different pieces are there, they have never really been combined. Then you need certain support, so we were reaching out and we get also other communities' involvement. Sometimes they are in there, sometimes they are not, depending on which tool support you get better or worse support. You need to have a larger outreach, so it can either speeds up or slows down. Then the original demo was just on a Linux RT pre-made RFS, but we wanted to bring a use case on top. So then we have a new, I call it OS distro, whatever you want to, a new image, a new build in there. And this need to get built then later on. So we were also looking what, how can we make use of the CI? How can we make use of tools? We started a way around with the Morlin, which is a build, meta build tooling, which can basically build Android. It's still comparable to cars if you've heard about it. And this was bringing things together, but we were not really experts on Morlin, and it's just a smaller tool, so it was another challenge on that. And what really broke our neck in the end were proprietary drivers. So there were graphics GPU drivers which were available, and they were available for native, but they were not there as downloadable for a virtualized Xen environment. And there was also not a direct pass for it. So we were there, there's a, I will make a reference it in the presentation tomorrow on the reproducible reference image, but we ended up with a pull request. We were in discussion with the CI, we put it in the GitLab, and then we saw, okay, we cannot build the full image. We sort of maybe mocking something up because people who have the hardware have also the chance to get into the binaries, and maybe we just need some header files or so, but it was too much in there. And by this, uh, we thought maybe better start small and uh, see what works already. So we have the working environment as mentioned from the previous automotive session. Here we have a full setup and we'll just move over now again to an additional hardware, to a better supported hardware. And for this part, uh, we were considering currently the XU 102. The good part about this is uh, yeah, the Xilinx hardware is very close to what Stefano set up on QEMO, so they are very closely related because the QEMO from Xilinx is very yeah, in-depth to and very close to the hardware, so we can even get image one-on-one -on -one further. We cannot easily take the QEMO part because performance issues may pop up if we do ARM emulation on this, and for this part we're considering this. But it's just the first step because the XU 102, which is still quite in use, it's quite expensive and we would like to come to hardware which is affordable by communities. And we first thought about going for all the Ultra 96 boards as an alternative option from the Inauro. And there's also an Ultra 96 V2 from Xilinx which would be supported, but um, both are also a little bit older from the hardware as such and then it's a question how long will they be supported? How long will we have a product out of it? So therefore, we also now started considering maybe the CRIA, CRIA board, which is for AI, for robotics, which gives a wide use case scope. But we didn't start off with this one because yeah, we made our trials with the other hardware before. And so if you not have a one-on-one -on -one match, it gives you harder discussion and to make critical resources human resources in their the life as easy as possible. We said better spend in the initial phase a little more money on the hardware, but then have a good direct outreach to experts and then take this understanding to bring it forward to more hardware. Yeah, what we already did on the other hardware was to replace the Linux RT by an AGL. Not exactly the automotive use case, but we had the AGL part in there. We also put a Debian image on it. We could see that the graphics were working, all this, but it was more the trial, not really a documented full flow in there. But we saw that it was not an issue to go from the original setup with the tooling on the other hardware. So we believe this will go on easily. And 
Then, as we already did the first step, we we'll also believe that it's easier to have it in the CI. Uh, most problematic part may be the shipping later on again, if you know about shipping hardware across the globe. It's never easy, so therefore, the usage of later community hardware would say it in the range up to three, four hundred dollars more or less. This is something which is crucial because then you avoid a lot of shipping problems and uh, export control regulations and so on. The S bomb is started. We know that there is support for Xen and Zephyr, so this could be something which. Yocto. And Yocto? Exactly, yeah. I missed the Yocto part here because we have it already. <laughs> Thanks for pointing it out. Uh, and then the ultimate part of it is to have this set up with three different, with an Artos, with the uh, virtualization and Linux involved, that, and working in a similar way like for automotive, where someone just adds a pull request to one of these elements and it's directly get checked, you can replace parts. And by this you have a reproducible setup, which is stable and if we take the previous session with uh, Shua, she explains how things look like she may not want to do 100 gigabyte download, building, wasting time on her machine while she wants to trace a workload. And by this, she could just download a pre-made image, getting maybe debug symbol, and she will definitely figure out something which does not work as she expects. So she can open a PR, we can check the PR directly, and it gives a much more direct flow and a chance for everybody to hook up on the level where needed. And this is basically the evolutionary step from the automotive use case where it worked, doing the trials on previous hardware, being blocked by proprietary drivers, and then now go over to a full setup. I put a little bit a summary on why we have these activities and how it creates certain flexibility because it's not just for setting up. We have a rather Linux Foundation projects focus in there, but it also means we have a good network established from outreach and so on. It makes communication sometimes easy, but it's not limited to it. So we also have, for example, the Apertis outreach, uh, which is on a stronger Bosch focus. So that's why we can just get it in and have some experts, which basically just not concentrating on it for now and more concentrating on Yocto and AGL. But anyway, but by this, if we start with Yocto, and I mentioned the Smallin tool before, we have two build tools. We can see where is the benefit of the one and the other. And if the system builds with both, we will see what are interfaces, how are differences in there. And I don't become dependent on Yocto. I don't be a dependent fully on Molin. And by this, I have a flexible part. And I see this is an interface. Here I can exchange something. And I will learn by documenting it. And someone taking it has an easier way of getting it into CI, CD pipeline. Then, similar with AGL operators, I mentioned it before, one is a Yocto based image, the other image is a Debian image, and by this you're more flexible in creating later on your flavor of Linux, because these are the two major ones which I see currently in the embedded scope, maybe more, but this, if we make it compatible for both, we have a chance to see. The both parts, QEMO plus the embedded hardware, is also to see, on the one hand, we will. I'm pretty sure we will keep both in there because the QEMO is just cool. You just start things up, build it, test it, run it, but it's not representing, it's not so nice for demoing it, showcasing it on fairs because it's just looking like here's the PC, it runs on a PC, whereas it, people want to touch, see, feel something. And it also helps us then having the hardware and the interfaces. But if we are rely on maybe on certain hardware interfaces or whatever, we can see it back in the QMO because they may not be there and we can say, okay, what is the difference? We get in architectural differences with typically x86, which we're using the QMO on, plus an ARM architecture. And this gives us also the flexibility here to swap things, yeah. The SPDX, SBOM generation is maybe not so much for the flexibility in the end. The flexibility comes in if we have the different systems, if we grow things together. And the idea is to really have a single source full system as bomb. So uh, we have no cycle on the X interactions for now because there's any way conversion from A to B possible on a lot of things, but just to see how all of the things get together. And yeah, also with the Xen and Zephyr part, it's just to show this is an example part and it's compared to model real world architectures. And basically the initial thing where you saw the setup from the Linux RT plus Zen and Zephyr, which Stefano was doing, is based on an industrial customer 
use case which he had. So he did not just invent the system, it was a system which was used in a customer project. So what comes next then on our roadmap? I said 23 plus, it all depends of course how many people join and how many workflows we have. Uh, this question comes quite often, well, when will it be done? The more support we get, the faster it goes. But for now, um, yeah, the first step will be to merge the automotive use case into this. I have shown this on another slide that we already had the AGL in there, but we just took the plain AGL image and not the modification from the meter Eliza. Should be just one more step in there and any way in one system set up, so it should work out easily. Uh, we are not bound to the use case at shut. We could also go for another use case because we're just setting up a system architecture now. So if someone brings a good use case, a good benefit, requirements to the system, or workforce potentially, this can also be good for reaching out to Sophie, Eclipse, SDV, and Linaro. That's a good recommendation, similar like Linaro, from the Linaro discussions, there was the information to say, oh, let's go with the CREA maybe because the community support is stronger than with the Ultra 96 bot, which are both there in Linaro. Yeah, of course, a major thing, it's just an example, but the Linux Features Workgroup, they look into certain topics which support safety. OSEP part will be also there. All the workgroup results should get into the system so that the workgroups can experience what does it mean if my enhancement, my work is operating in a system environment, but also vice versa that others can really experience the system. So that's where the CI really brings benefits. I mentioned containers. Uh, and a cloud connection I haven't mentioned, but I mean, everything is better with containers and everything is better with cloud. So, and if it's just for selling. <laughs> I, what, what we definitely have for this use case is a later system will most likely be connected to the internet. And there will be, even if it's not the cloud, it depends on what gets computed. Is it AI based? So the AI part I missed in this list uh, but this is where does the workload run? Is there a workload digital twin, whatever? And you need to face and you need to have this in your consideration. And if this is in the reference system, uh, maybe someone comes and says, my use case is not relevant to it. Most likely people 10 years back have also not thought that the USB printer connected to a router may suddenly be exposed to the internet and you can print from whatever remote because there were no security settings enabled in a USB connection for a printer. So for this, I guess it's good for having the mind in there. Even if you don't make a strong use of container, if you don't make a strong use of cloud connection, the later product may have it. And if it doesn't have it now, if there's a right for updates for many years and the people ask like, update my program, I have a software defined environment, there will be most likely something like this coming up. And yeah, the idea was also not to tailor this down. If we had the automotive use case, we can see how do we bring in the medical devices use case in the aerospace use case. The open APS may not be the ideal use case for it because it has a full setup, it has a certain scope, it's on the Raspberry Pi. But if we find a new use, use case, additional one, this could be a good enhancement for this. So for this, uh, we have our regular calls on uh, US friendly time. So it's Monday evenings. Uh, European time, so morning time. Whereas I guess it would be here 8 a.m. more or less this time, so there should be a good range. Uh, it's also a little bit the automotive alternative meeting, I have to say, so it's, you can pick up information from automotive on the Monday meeting because the automotive work group meets on Wednesday morning European time, which is not very US friendly then, but more Asia friendly, and by this we just get the one and the other side together. Meeting minutes, uh, everything is open. The repository is not as nicely populated as the other work groups, so we're still working on this. You find the work in progress pull request, for example, in there on the original reference system, which we built, also with some screenshots, how the demo already looked like, uh, with graphic support and Xen with Zephyr enabled, but you will not be able to reproduce as such due to the proprietary drivers. And by this, I come to the end of my presentation. I have chat questions, this is nice. This gives us some time. So. Yeah, 
So what the first question which I see is what the path forward given the limited support for graphics that you might be using. Is there an open source analog for Q working with QAMO? I see it as two parts. So for the QAMO this was and Q this was easy. The graphics drivers underneath so we could also go for Flutter and other parts, but this is not on the graphics driver. So there is a base support for QM on graphics, graphics support, but we already saw if we go for ARM emulated QMO versions, then graphics is another story. So suddenly you may not have graphics in there anymore. But what we did now was basically really looking for a supported uh, hardware. We know that Xilinx is working on certain graphics support and to see our use case, what could be ways out of it so that we don't fall into the same problem again is first of all going for open source graphics driver, which are partially there, but still not full with Xen support. Um, we have strong GPU developers where we can better outreach to, to get information from them, get support there. Plus, we may limit from a multi-display use case, start with a one display use case. So the idea was to have an infotainment system next to an instrument cluster, similar like architectures are built, but the time given which we have and the resources could be that we start with just one setup and we say, let's just render one. This makes an easier graphic sharing experience functionality, but it's not about the safety split of a GPU hardware abstraction. So this is basically the things in there. And the new hardware which we selected has the idea of having a better GPU support. Yeah, then there's this question, is this something that anyone can duplicate? Uh, that the overall intention for now, you can just duplicate the Linux uh, automotive workgroup part, which is just a Linux cell, but we have a session on this also in June, so I hope by the June timeframe for the Embedded Open Source Summit in Prague, we show you how the whole setup will run on the XU 102, and then giving us three, a quarter further toward the autumn. You never know how things work out. I thought I would already show it today, more or less, as such a setup, but uh, given the June timeframe, I'm currently quite confident that we show a setup which you can also just reproduce by buying the hardware, and we may be even also sharing just maybe to other labs, CIA or kernel CI labs or so, Lava workers, that people can also make use of the hardware and trying things out, right. Is there any documentation of the system architecture that represents both the emulated and the working system? We started with this documentation, which showed the, uh, not the emulated, so the emulated documentation is there in forms of a presentation forms of a little bit of documentation on Xilinx website, so it's more like grabbing pieces of it. This was the idea of the work group to really write down the things, and we have this work in progress pull request for the other hardware, but then we stopped at this point because, well, there is documentation, which is local steps, but it's not someone who can really reproduce and improve the documentation because this helped in the automotive work group. There was the first person writing down the documentation, then someone from the group just followed the description and reproduce it, found issues by it because the environment is not always identical. Then we had a one month more or less stop and we looked at it a month later again and figured out, well, there's still something which sounded natural before, so improved this. And we're now bringing all these pieces forward. So I guess we will have a pull request by the June timeframe and then it's a lot of documentation. It's basically more documentation than doing things. So therefore, uh, when you want to duplicate it, you need the documentation for it. This documentation, which we have in the working progress pull request, I guess is not sufficient for someone who wants to do it and uh, that their way then forward to have a full description. Then I mentioned requirements somewhere. And the question then is also, are there requirements for the system that have been captured. Uh, no. <laughs> we have the use case from the automotive. The automotive work group captured requirements also on so functional requirements, non-functional requirements, and so on. But we were concentrating on creating a reference system, an example system. 
and will then see on the use cases, on the demand from the other work groups, from what we set up, maybe also from Sophie and uh, the Eclipse SDV, that there are requirements to the system, and then we can capture them and also see how they are implemented. But we really concentrated on getting a system set up and see how it fits to the work group, that the work groups can integrate, that others can integrate and pull things out. And we'll see also that request, feature request, bug reports bring us closer to the requirements handling because we provide a service infrastructure more or less and the use case uh, functional requirements part for this will come in and then we can, I guess we will also have already implicit requirements, explicit requirements over the last year where we are talking. Uh, we just haven't written them all down in a formal requirements tool. Yeah, we should start doing writing things on this down. Yeah. So for not for every part we are doing, we are fully safety compliant process in our working groups <laughs> from the workforce we bring. Yeah. Yeah, we have start somewhere, and uh, and I was mentioning the other working uh, the related project, for example, Deathfire. They also recently opened their um, safety track to public. There was more or less member part and. Say again, Kate? Only part of it. Only part of it. Yeah. yeah, part of it is open, but there you can see that on the mailing list there's discussion going on for requirements tool, what to use, how to write down requirements. What we have done in Elisa, automotive work group regarding requirements, we were actually going into, or we, we started writing down requirements, and then it's really nice to see what, what happens. There is this ISO 26262 process. There is... Uh, ISO 9001, CMMI, there's a whole lot of processes. And if you, at least from my experience, if you give it to developers, there's always, why should I follow all these processes, right? Where is this? And it just adds something on top of my normal work. I don't have the time for it, or whatever. There are good reasons not for many for not doing it. But what we figure out in the automotive work group, and this I found very interesting, we started with nothing. And then it was like, okay, a new person came in, asked the same question again, and another person comes, asks a question, say, oh, we need to write down our design. So we started to write down some design parts which we were doing, and say, oh, here, look there, there's something which we have. And it's like, but this is like this and this, and I'm like, oh, no, we have another requirement. So we started to write down requirements, and it's like, oh, I have this requirement, and I have another element there. Suddenly I have two requirements, three, four, five, and I figure out, there is suddenly an ASIL maybe attached so that we say, okay, this is safety relevant, not safety relevant, higher level of, it's just a QM quality managed part, so we had to fill in attributes. And then what happens is you write down one R requirement and another one, they may derive and they may be related to each other. So you need to trace between requirements, see that they fit to each other. So we had the next thing and uh, at this time we used, I always make the two plane, it's either free plane or free mind, whatever, uh, <laughs> to check which I insert. The mind map, and we used the mind mapping tool, and the nice thing is that you can write uh, your own little extensions, and we have this extension then written down by the former automotive work group lead, so greetings to Jochen, if you <laughs> listen to this. Um, he has written this tool, put it also in the GitHub, where you can actually trace down the requirements, and when you change something, uh, you can see, okay, here is a conflicting part, here are dependencies. So we were doing this because we needed this, and we had this also for our design part. We started with the design, writing it down in plant UML, and then we figured out plant UML is nice to write down. It's code-based, but how to establish a good traceability and see if something from the design changes. So we went on to uh, Papyrus, which is Eclipse project. This was much nicer for traceability, but much harder for the ramp up of people so that then we had some people who could work with it. We had good traceability, but the others were not trained for the tools, so the work got stuck on this and they start writing other things again. So we changed back to another tool and this was going forth and back, but it shows you how suddenly things get interconnections and how such an ISO 26262, an ISO 9001, and CMMI, was created and why it was there and that you need traceability and just from trying things out, see there is a demand, you need a tool and that we had this demand and you see it now also for the safety for Zephyr partially opened and the first thing is let's discuss about the requirement and the requirements tool for it because we have many different parties 
and interacting. And if you have a small project where you may be two engineers and you're just working closely to each other, you may not see the strong demand of writing down all the design decisions, writing all the requirements. But as soon as someone enters the project, you start on this. And then it's three, four, five if it scales and will only scale if you have proper documentation, proper requirements handling. And that's what we experienced live while we were doing it. And this is, it was really, really nice thing to just see that there is a demand for it. Yeah. Cool. No more question from the audience? Shaking hats. No, my questions are <laughs> I got some online questions, all right. Cool, then we are close to the end. We ha don't have the aerospace session, unfortunately. Uh, I think like yeah, like I guess we do a virtual follow-up here. And there is one also overall tomorrow for those who are enough, not, uh, well, everyone who joined virtually will also be able to join virtually tomorrow, hopefully, and otherwise there will be recordings. So, and this gives you a full session. Yeah. We have also more on the Critical Software Summit next day, I guess also all tracks for tomorrow. So you will also see a talk from Stefano on the safety certification steps by Xen project, uh, some other use cases involvement where Linux is used and also related topics from security, ASPOM generation. So how they fit in these systems. And there's also the reproducible environments. So some more story about what I've said about the systems here and automotive. Right, then, I guess it was very nice to have a little bit of audience here, some good questions in the chat, participation, and thanks a lot for your time. <laughs>